C++ 11 in Qt 5. Uh, this is not a presentation about Qt. So if you wanted the tutorial about how to program with Qt, that was Monday. Uh, this is really about how we're trying to use C++ 11 to make our lives easier. And because some of our users are asking to use C++ 11 features while using Qt. Um, so somebody asked me, do I need to know about Qt to come to the session? No, you don't. Uh, some, lots of Qs are going to show up. So you're going to see lots of the letter Q. And by the way, if you don't know the story, have you ever heard why Qt is called Qt? So apparently the reason why is because the letter Q was nice in the font of the front, one of the founders. <laughs> was, nice in the was nice in the font in Emacs in one of the founder's laptops. That's why. <laughs> I thought it was because he liked QuickTime. No. So <laughs> it is, it's not this font. Um, so the original font was because the letter Q was nice. So they had the Q toolkit. And then they founded the company and they had to come up with a name for it. So the f original name of Trolltech was Quasar Technologies. And that lasted about two days until they figured out that was silly and just changed the name again. So up until this day, cute just means cute. Anyway, so who am I? I'm Tiago Macieira. I'm an open source developer. If you've been to my previous presentation, I've got the same slide. Uh, open source developer for 15 years. And I got into C++ because of, uh, of KDE and Qt. I was actually trying to do IPv6 support and everything I write. I mean, one of the first things I did when I came back to Qt was, let's make sure IPv6 works. Uh, today I work for the Open Source Technology Center at Intel. Uh, we do a lot of open source activities and uh, all the way from kernel development, going through middleware, all the way to web technologies. Uh, most of my colleagues are working in C. There are very few that work in C++. And uh, those, of, uh, those that did work with Qt for a time and then now have to work with something else, they keep complaining and come to me to vent, like, why can't I get a destructor? And I, I understand them exactly, because every time I write C, is like the same thing. In the Qt project, I maintain two modules. A Qt bus module is uh, IPC mechanism. It doesn't generate much activity for me. The Qt core module is the module doing, dealing with uh, containers, dealing with file system support, dealing with threading, event loop, um, architectural support. So all of those are my area. And you're going to see that it, it turns out that many of the C++11 solutions we either had thought of or had something similar, or now we can use them in Qt Core as well. Anyway, so Qt 5, um, I had to update this slide right now because um, Beta 1 was released yesterday. Qt 5.1, Beta 1 is out as of yesterday. Um, the goals we had for Qt 5 were those here. We're just trying to improve the technology, set the foundation for the next seven years, six, seven years, however long it's going to take until Qt 6. And binary compatibility wise, we know how to do this. So my presentation yesterday was how did we accomplish the same thing for seven and a half years? So we know how to do it. <coughs> but in terms of content, in terms of technologies, what can we do? Um, so we wanted to add new and modern features. We wanted to add new code. And at the same time, keep compatibility with Qt 4. Um, for those who did work with Qt 3 back in uh, the early 2000s and did the transition to Qt 4, that was rather painful. It was a lot of work because it changed a lot. And we learned from that. We decided this is a uh, wasted effort. The API is good, probably good enough. We can probably just maintain source compatibility, or most of it. That is part of the challenge for us, because we're trying to maintain source compatibility with something that was designed in 2004, 2005. So we're trying to add C++11 to something that didn't have it. So how did we do this? How did this affect our decisions? Our challenge there is we would have liked to switch to C++11. We can't. So we need to maintain compatibility, not only because our users are expecting the same API because they want what they already thought of, the, what the, their code was already working, but also because they're using older compilers. 
And for us, older is Microsoft Visual Studio 2008 and GCC 4.2. And this is only on uh, Mac OS. If you're using anything else other than Mac OS, I'm going to tell you to upgrade uh, from GCC. And many commercial Unix compilers are still lagging behind support in uh, C++ 11. Thankfully, it's coming quickly. All of them are coming uh, up very quickly on, on new features, much more quickly than C++ 98 in the past. Still, we're not there. It's only as of GCC 4.8.1, which was last month, I think, and Clang unreleased version, that we've got feature complete language support. I'm not even talking about the library. I'll get to that a bit later. But language support, C++ 11, now we're feature complete in those two open source compilers. That is great. I can experiment with it. I can start working with it. <coughs> this quote here, C++ 98 costs more, is from uh, a colleague of mine um, in, Nuremberg, uh, in Dusseldorf last year. Uh, when we presented this, he was uh, co-presenting with me. And his idea is something that I want to pass to you guys. And if you're consultants working on C++, tell your client, C++ 98 costs more. I'll, I can do it in C++ 11. If you want me to support C++ 98 in addition, then I'm going to charge you more. This is something we're doing, for example, right now in Qt 5. So some new features are coming. I'm telling people, um, fair enough, implement it in C++ 11. First, do it in C++ 11. Go ahead, use standard function, use whatever you need. Variadic templates, our value, our auto. Once you're done, let's figure out what we need to support C++ 98. If it's too much, I don't care. Let's not support 98. So what we're doing is um, we added a lot of support to C++ 98 already in 4.8. There was already some beginning of it. But if you were on my previous session yesterday, I told you that we do not add features to minor releases. Qt 4.8 was first released in December 2011, just more or less the same time as the standard was ratified. That means we could not add new features after that. Qt 5.0 came one year later, so it has more features already. 5.1 has a few more again. So there's a lot of stuff left to do for 5.2 even. Um, I'm going to get to those uh, later. <laughs> So uh, move semantics, we have a few problems. But again, I got more detailed slides. Our biggest challenge, though, is this. We want to support all four combinations here, same binaries. So if you're compiling Qt with a C++ 98 compiler, and your application is compiled with a C the same C++ 98 compiler, fair enough. Everything works. But you can also use a C11 compiler in your application. And the same library will work. And all the features will work. Conversely, same thing. I actually want to compile Qt with C11. If your compiler supports it, this is already automatically enabled. But I'm not forcing your application to do it. So that needs to work. One binary build, we build it once. Either way, we choose to build. It's going to produce the same binary. <coughs> no, not the same binary. The same binary interface. So any application will still compile, but you get better performance here. And you get better performance there, even. I hope I don't have to explain to you why C11 is giving us potential for being faster and being better. Smaller code base as well. So this is the challenge we have. Yes. Here, sorry, they're not I'll in the back. You first, yes. I'm kind of unsure about this combination of C++ 98 Qt and C++ in application. Are you doing, are you setting the Qt mode, Qt C++ mode at compile time, or is it, a, I mean, at, at build time, or is it a compile time test? So, you can't see this, <laughs> too bad. Um, the question is, how are we doing this? Just explain a little, a little more. What, what we want is that when Qt is compiled, it will detect which com what your compiler supports. And if it does support C11, it will turn it on. 
So GCC and Clang, for example, require a special flag to do it. Microsoft Visual Studio requires no flag. It's always enabled. So we're always going to use what your compiler supports. So we're going to detect at compile time of the library what the features are, and then we're going to use the most that that compiler provides to create better performing code. Notwithstanding that, we need to have the same binary interface. So we cannot have anything, because the compiler supports it, that would cause new functions to appear or disappear. Now, the, uh, we did not make a choice for the application. Applications, for whatever reason, they might not want to start using C++11 yet. Or they might want to use a different compiler that doesn't support it yet. So that happens in some embedded cases where applications come from different sources. So we have, we let the application choose what they want. And can be, the more common case is that the library was compiled with a version of the compiler and then the user upgraded. And then the, 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 the new compiler has more features. So the application is using it, but nothing needs to change in the binary code. I'm going to explain a little more how we accomplish this. There was a question in the back? Yeah, I'm just curious. So, I mean, do you have some kind of concrete measures about whether or not you're actually achieving the better performance that you might? So the question is, do we have any concrete measures to prove that we are faster? To be honest, I've never run a benchmark, but given some of the things I'm going to show you, it's evident that the, the code generation is better. One particular case I'm going to point out when I get to it shows code being a lot better. And then, of course, um, move semantics, improve a little. Uh, just little by little. So I don't know whether those two pluses there mean a lot or a little, but I know that it's non-zero. Okay. So I'm trying to answer your question now. How did we accomplish this? We enable it automatically, like I said. But the source code still must build in C++ 98, because we don't know what the compiler does, which other compilers the user is going to use. So whatever we do in our source code, we either must write with a C++ 98 version, or we need to if def, depending on what is supported. And we have to provide the same library ABI. So what does that concretely mean? It means that we can use C++ 11 features if we want to, in our own code, as long as there is a fallback if that feature is not available in the library code. In the headers, however, in our headers, everything that is in line, we can use the new features. Right? Because that ends up in the user code. What I said before about having new features that only support C++11, that means the library is compiled once, it doesn't matter whether that feature is enabled or not, but the front-end interface might require C++11 to be accessed. Yes? Just to clarify, you see this, this difference between building in C++11 and building the application in C++11. So just to give you a concrete example, let's say you have a move inline move constructor in one of your Qt headers, and I build the Qt in using a C++ 98 mode, and then I use in my application this header in C++ 11 mode. Will the const this move constructor be available to me or not? So the question's about a specific example. Supposing we have a move constructor that is in line in one of the headers, if you're using C++11, it will be used, provided the conditions match, of course, for moving. Even though the library, the Qt library itself. Exactly. Even though the library itself was not compiled with C++98, this move constructor will be called. Very careful, we talked about an inline move constructor. I'm going to get to a case where that doesn't work. I'm not sure I understand the question. So, so if you compile like a, a I don't know if Qvector has, I'm sure it's using move 
you know, constructors now? It has moved constructors. It doesn't have moved semantics of the objects in themselves. When you add an object, it doesn't have move into the, the vector. So it doesn't have in place? It doesn't have in place moving yet. So, yet. so if, if you uh, basically did what he said, you compiled your application using C++11, you would, I'm to, those definitions are probably in the header files, right? The move constructor? Yes. So you would move constructs with the, the move constructors. But then let's say that one of the Qt libraries took a Q vector. Um, let's say by value, what would happen? So what you're saying is what would happen if there is a library function taking a Q vector by value? By the way, there aren't any, but suppose that there were. And does it change whether the application is compiled with C++11 or C++98? The answer it doesn't change. The only change is on the user code. So the user code will either copy or move Right? But that's in the application code. The library code doesn't care. It gets a value, period. So if you went to Chandler's session yesterday and he was talking value semantics, value semantics, value semantics, it only works for inline. If you're talking about the, the body compiled elsewhere, already compiled, and you cannot change it, the compiler does not see what it's doing, that doesn't apply. This is why all the Q vectors in our library code are passed by const reference. Because there is no point. The value semantics, what you would get, the improvements that he talked about in his session, do not apply if the compiler cannot see through the other library code. Well, except if you're using LTO. Except if you're using LTO, true. But then you're compiling that other one, right? And then we, that it doesn't matter, okay. right? So I think I mentioned this already. Uh, compiler support, we required CC 4.4, unless you're on Mac. 4.2 still works. Please do not use it. Really, please do not use it, because we know that it's now generating bad code. I have several examples. Uh, I even am going to be evil to you. Uh, Qt, when compiled with CC 4.2 on Mac, generates dead code. A lot of dead code, because um, the CPU ID detection doesn't work, so it's blacklisted. So it always concludes you're running on an older processor, but the code for the newer processors are there, just never enabled. Question. Yes? Uh, do you have any plans on when you're going to drop 10.6 support and therefore the 4.2 compiler? So the question is, when do we plan on dropping support for macOS 10.6? Um, usually what we used to do is support three versions of macOS at the same time. The latest two were deploy and develop. So that would be today 10.7 and 10.8. You can develop Qt and deploy Qt on it. And the earlier one, which is 10.6 today, you can um, deploy to. You cannot develop on it, but you can create an application that runs on it. Um, these things are changing for two reasons. First, we are everybody's moving to Clang on uh, Mac. So we're trying to figure out what to do. And uh, we really want to use C++, uh, lib C++, because otherwise it doesn't enable, um, uh, it doesn't enable C++ 11. Right, that's why I say if you want, if you want your stuff to run on 10.6, then and you have to keep the GCC 4.2. Yes, exactly. So, but, so that's what I was, why I was asking. When are you planning on dropping? I, the answer is I do not know when we're planning to drop but it will probably be soon. And the other reason is that Apple is uh, speeding up their release cycles. So now they're now doing every year releases of Mac OS, whereas previously they were doing every 18 months to two years. So when we were supporting three versions that were released two years apart, that means we had a lot of uh, support for existing applications. Now if we shrink that to three years, our customers are going to say, I need to develop and deploy on that older system because my clients are using it and they cannot upgrade. So this is a decision we haven't made completely. Um, in terms of Clang itself, uh, I know that there were some Clang or NetLVM developers in the conference. If there's any way you can get Apple to stop changing the version number, that would be helpful. Because we get different version numbers depending on whether it's Apple's build or the official <laughs> Clang. And we do not know whether some features are enabled or not. So some things are in disabled if it's Apple. 
because we don't know the version number. Minimum version today is 3.0. ICC also enables automatically C++11. Minimum version is 12.0. And Visual Studio, like I said, cannot be disabled. But then the minimum version is 2008. Yes? Is, for Clang, is there a reason why you don't use the uh, feature macros? The question is, do we use the feature macros? Yes, we do use the feature macros. Uh, there are a couple of other things I can find in the source code why. Uh, but there are a few things that didn't work, and I believe they were compiler bugs. So it's like, feature is declared as existing, but when we use it, we run into bugs. I had some slides on it. They're hidden because I don't want to talk about the bugs, but we can talk about it later. So just like I was saying, it's not been enough without problems. We run into compiler bugs. Uh, as soon as you try to use the new features as just as they're implemented, sometimes they're not working as expected. The other thing is that there are different implementations, not only between compilers interpreting the standard, but sometimes they implemented previous versions of the papers, especially when before the, the standard was out. And they change along the way. So the behavior changed and we had to update it. And like we have the requirement to keep some things as they are, the API, the ABI. So we had some difficulty making those changes. So how have we done this? The, Details are like this. Some of the features can be used under ifdef. Right? We have lots of Q compiler macros. Um, so I went through the standard, the, C++, the GCC and Clang pages on what features exist in C++, etc. 11. Created a list. They're all checked and tested on all compilers we support and all existing versions. So if you include qglobal.age, you get these defines and you can start using them. So for example, um, we were talking about QVector, but QList has uh, a move constructor here. I don't know if the people in the back can see it. Uh, with, if our value refs are, are present, we start using um, move, move semantics. Similarly, if initializer lists are present, we support initializer list for um, QList, QVector, QMap, and all the other containers. Some features do not require if def because it's too ugly. It would be just too much. So what we've done is that we have macros for things that we want everywhere without an if def and just enables as necessary without changing uh, ABI. So for example, all constexp we're using, we have a macro for it. Um, Similar with the uh, no accept. Now, one thing I need to be careful about is Visual Studio currently does not support constexp. Once it does, the question is, will this be part of the mangling of a symbol? Because if it is, I cannot add it to an existing function. Right? I don't have a problem with going from an existing Visual Studio version that doesn't support to a version that does support because, of course, they're already binary compatible between each other. But within one version, an upgrade queued, can I add this macro to an existing function? We will know when Visual Studio supports it. We have some features also available in C++ 98, either because the compilers support it as an extension, and that extension became the C++ 11 feature, or because they supported add as an add-on. Um, example is like a line of. This has been supported by many compilers. Most of them have the align of uh, macro um, as an extension. So you can just use it. Um, Microsoft Visual Studio had support for override and final <coughs> in 98. They had a different name for final but it is the semantic. Similar to no throw. Uh, the new no accept is the behavior that Visual Studio had for no throw. So we can use that in Visual Studio. We cannot use no throw, the C++ 98 and C++ 03 one, because that has a different semantic, the one that was considered wrong in the standard and was replaced. And finally, there are some features of C++ 11 that we just do not use. Because 
they would require an ifdef to be used, and that just reduces readability. So for example, the template closing brackets, we're never going to use them for now. Because to do that would require an ifdef of the same line, and you get no benefit, so we just don't use it. This list here includes things that might change in the future. future. Uh, range 4, for example, I doubt that we will start using it soon. Auto types, neither. We do use, however, some things either in hidden semantic or where they are required. So an auto type is required or auto <coughs> functions are required in certain template cases to simplify code. And as I said, the library features are close to no use. They're coming too slowly. Uh, even um, G the now feature complete C++11 language, Clang and GCC, do not have a very broad implementation of the new library features. So we just cannot use them now. And it's very difficult to determine what is supported or not by way of an, uh, of an if def. So uh, we end up duplicating it in Qt anyway. Some headers are required for uh, language features. There's no way you can implement type traits without include type traits. It's just, not as it's just not implementable without it, so we have to use it. Initializer list, same thing. The type standard initializer list is, only, is, is a compiler type. There's no way I can define it. That means, however, if you replace the standard library, which some OSs do, example, Qnix, that means the feature is disabled because the header is missing. So far, so good? So I'm going to go back in history a little and talk about C++ 98. It took a long time to come after the standard. You must have felt the same pain we did. Um, we supported Visual Studio 6 all the way to 2009. That's about 13, no, not 13 <coughs> years. It's about 11 or 12 years of support of that compiler. We supported it longer than Microsoft did because our clients kept using it despite Microsoft and us telling them, please upgrade. For one very specific reason, uh, if you used Visual Studio 6, you did not have to distribute the, uh, the, the assemblies from Visual Studio, because all Windows comes with it. That was why people wanted it. It did not support C++ 98, so we did not have member templates. All member templates we had in Qt had to have, were if deft out for um, Visual Studio 6. No partial template specialization, no template template parameters. It even did not have the type name keyword. So all of these things we end up um, and, and it's only recently that we got rid of those. And that was the last compiler by the time of 5.0 that had uh, these missing features. Everything else we support today has uh, the C++ 98 features. Yes? Does it mean that Q5 doesn't support Sun Studio? Because that thing is about C++ 98. The question is, does Q5 support Sun Studio? Sun Studio latest version, like 11, do support 98 pretty well. What it doesn't support, and thank you for asking, that's it here. So we require uh, the standard library, C++ 98 standard library, to compile Qt now. There's no, no STL option anymore. That means if you're using Sun Studio under its default configuration, which is to use the Rogue Wave um, standard library that is pre-C++ 98, it's going to fail to compile. Say, no, you can change it. There's also an option for the compiler that changes it either to STL port or another one. You just change the library, that will work. Yeah, so. but have you upgraded to Qt 5? Yeah, so when you upgrade to Qt 5, you're going to have to figure out and you have to change standard libraries because the default one that comes with Solar, uh, Sun Studio and Solaris. Yeah, oh, you're getting rid of Solaris. <laughs> okay, so I said all features. Well, 
there's one more. There's one remaining feature that is still not supported on all C++ and compilers. This template friends. So this code here does like, I'm trying to, this is QShared pointer, inside QShared pointer. I'm trying to be friends with QShared pointer itself, but with a different template parameter. This is only supported as far as I can tell in GCC and GCC compatible compilers that's Clang and ICC. On other compilers, it just makes these functions public. So we still have one remaining C++ 98 feature that is not supported in C++ and all compilers that we support today. Okay, you didn't come here for C++ 98. So what do we do for C++ 11? I mentioned that a line of is something that not only has been supported for a long time as extensions in other compilers, but also that we allow it to be used anywhere. Doesn't matter how you're using, if you're compiling 98 or 11, it's allowed anywhere. Because we try to use those extensions if they were available. And if they're not, there's a trick that we can do uh, with, uh, with a struct. Basically what you, do, uh, what you do is that you create a structure with a car and your type. And you measure the offset of, of that type. That's the alignment. That works except on one ABI, because on x86, because of past reasons, the alignment of double and everything bigger than uh, four bytes was four bytes. But on the stack, they're eight bytes. So one known case. Um, now, the aligned macro, that's a different thing. We cannot support that everywhere. So we cannot have something like uh, the align as support that C++11 brings. So, and it's very difficult to emulate. Uh, there's no way to do it right without compiler support. So we could do it with an unrestricted union, but then that's another C++11 feature. <coughs> we have to deal with it. I'm going alphabetically. So atomics, Qt has had an atomics API since Qt 4.4. And I was really pleased when reading the standard and seeing that everything that I had and I needed to in order to implement my Atomics API was in the standard. And a little more. So of course the, st the standard uh, committee went the extra mile to support everything that is needed. Uh, so I'm glad that I can implement it. My code is right now written in assembly. So I've got assembly for a lot of processors. Um, I don't even have the full list on my mind. Uh, <coughs> Everything that is current, we support. The only problem is that the Atomics libraries in the, in the compilers, they're so far been um, unsuitable. GCC added support in 4.6, but it was using its old intrinsics. That means it used full barriers everywhere. There were no relaxed. 4.7 added support for the new templates, for the new um, intrinsics, that's good, but only on x86. If you try to use, for example, anything on ARM, it would do a lock instead of doing what its old intrinsics did. So GCC 4.8 is the first one that has good support. I'm investigating now uh, how to do the switch. Right now we're still using, if you use 5.1 in current compilers, it's going to use our old uh, assembly code. So we need to keep our assembly for the time being. However, we also need to switch as soon as possible because of the memory model. Since the memory model is there, the compiler now can do a lot more optimizations than it couldn't previously because it was trying to figure out what the, the, the user was doing, the developer was doing. Using volat volatile was wrong, definitely, and we are abusing the compiler right now. We're hanging by a thread, uh, depending on the compiler not changing behavior, because we're using the atomics with the assembly in some ways that could potentially be, be trouble. So we need to change as, as soon as possible, but no sooner than the, 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 the atomics being equivalent to ours. So just to show you an example of um, a data race. I'm sorry, people in the back, you're probably not going to be able to read this. I'm going to read out for you. This is the event loop. Um, 
what it was doing is that in this function here, this is the function asking the event loop to exit from any thread. So one thread can tell, sorry, another, please exit. And what it did was that it saved the return code and a flag saying exit and then told it to interrupt. Let's not look at this one. The problem is that there was a data race here. Uh, the compiler could reorder these, reorder these two however it wanted. So it was possible that the exit was set and the, fun the other thread got interrupted before the return code became available in the other thread. So we had to change it, both of them to become atomic variables, store and store release. If you were on Tony's presentation on Monday, it's matched by an acquire here. So like I said, uh, the future for the atomics. I overhauled the code for 5.0. Uh, I'm using poor man's virtual with uh, CRTP. But we're still missing a few, a few features. Um, our uh, test and set functions do not return the current value. I want to add an overload that does. So what do I call it? And I think that fetch and test and set is a very long name. <laughs> should probably find something better. <coughs> I'm also wondering about um, implicit load and store operators. Um, the standard atomic API does have it. Qt4 had it. I removed in 5.0 for one reason. Uh, I didn't want people to mistakenly load things unless they knew it. I want them to make the decision. I'm loading and I'm using relaxed or acquire semantics. I want to know when it's been done. So if I add this functionality, I'm probably going to add an available under an if def, and you can disable it so you know I'm loading my code at this exact point. So far okay with atomics? Uh, Cons expression we're using is, um, we're, like I said, we're using it as much as we can everywhere. Uh, when we started using it, uh, the compilers did not support the full specification. And when they did, it broke our code. We had to go back and fix it. And twice, no, three times did we find compiler bugs with the same code. Uh, once in GCC, twice in Clang for the same code. The main reason why we want to use const expression is static initialization. We want our, some of our types to be initialized by the compiler, put it in the data or even uh, read-only data sections of the, the, the binary, do not cause runtime, load time uh, overhead. So uh, I talked about atomics. We're trying to do the same thing with uh, basic atomic and basic atomic pointer. Uh, there is this class called QBasic Mutex. It's not public, so keep it quiet. But same thing, we want to initialize it with a const expression. Everything else? Um, so how, do, how are we ap approaching this? These classes, these three classes here, the reason why they have a basic in their name is because they're plain old data. They don't have any constructors. Because we can't. It would break in C++ 98. But in C++11, we could add constructors to them. So for everything else, just these three, which we did that, everything else, we tell people do not use statics. All statics in Qt code are uh, plain old data or mistakes. Initializer lists, I talked about this before. Um, were provided in the containers, but we cannot use it in Qt itself. It would just mean if defs, uh, and it requires the header to be present. One particular case where we're using, uh, I'm using the same initializer list um, macro, but it's the new brace initialization. In some cases, it's not just sugar. You're required to use it if you want to do something different. Uh, this is the example of the UUID class, and it has a couple of members. One of them is an array. C++ 98, there's no way you can initialize that array in the constructor, in the, initial, in the constructor initialization list. You can in the body. But if you use the body, that constructor cannot be const expression. So in order to make a const expression constructor for QUID, we needed 
the initializer list feature. And then that thing back at the end there, uh, data four, it's the array of bytes. Lambdas, um, same thing as before. We added support for it. Uh, and this is one of the things that we were talking about before. There are functions in the library that are compiled however you compile Qt, C++ 98 or 11, that must be present. These functions, of course, they do not take lambdas. Uh, lambdas are uh, template type. You cannot create an ABI for it. So they take a structure, something similar to standard function, but we cannot use standard function because it wasn't there in C++ 98. So just something similar to standard function so that we can take that function defined at runtime and at, if you're compiling your code with C++ 11, you can use a lambda there. Um, so we cannot use it in Qt itself, but we do provide it for your own code. Uh, the presentation I made on Monday used this extensively, used lambdas extensively, just showing how you can do this. I was writing some code um, yesterday or the day before, and I thought, I really want to use a lambda here. Oh, it was this morning, actually. I was fixing a bug. I needed to write a unit test, and I really wanted a lambda. I had to create a functor outside in order to make it work. No except um, it improves code generation of the callers. So we're adding it as much as we can where it makes sense. Um, like I said before, Microsoft Visual Studio's no throw in C++ 98 has the same semantics that we want, the no except semantics. That is, the function declared with no except, the caller can assume that it does not throw. The function itself, if it's declared with no except, uh, in C++ 98, using no throw, what it needed to do is runtime check whether something did throw, throw, and then it had to call the terminate handler. In C++ 11, this allows a much simpler operation, simply declaring do not, for the runtime support, do not throw anything past this, so the runtime support will take care of it. The question is, does it add overhead? No, that's the biggest difference. This is why we're actually doing this now. Uh, no except and MSVCs no throw do not add overhead. Um, what happens if you break the contract? The question is, how, what happens if you break the contract? In the sense of, um, you don't. Let me answer, you don't break the contract. The compiler will not allow you to. So a function declared as no except will not throw. The compiler will not let you. If you try, the compiler will catch that at runtime. So the runtime will catch it and terminate the application. If you call a function that throws and you do not catch that on your own, the runtime will catch it and terminate the application. Look, if, if, you have, if you're calling a function that's not marked no except, will the compiler say that this is unsafe? Or is there still some sort of runtime check there? Um, if you, if you yeah. So what happens if you call a function without no except? So the function I'm calling does not have the no except inside the body of a function that is no except, right? Um, I looked at what the compiler does. What it does is that it simply declares that my outer function is no except. So the runtime, when it's trying to unwind the stack because of the thrown exception. It will run into that function and say, I cannot go further. So the, the overhead already associated with the presence of uh, the, the, the exception being thrown is stopping there. If none are thrown, there is no extra overhead, which was the question here. Right. So if something is thrown, I don't cause extra overhead. And if nothing is tr thrown, I have no overhead at all. So it eats the exception at that level? Yes, it eats the exception of that boundary and terminates the application. And you cannot recover from this. Our only problem, though, is what happens if you're trying to call, if you're using your own code, compiling with C++ 11, it sees the no except. 
but the library was compiled without it. So in that sense, it could and violate the contract. Most Qt code does not throw anyway, so we're probably safe. And except for Qt core and one or two more libraries, everything's already compiled without exception support, so they're never going to throw. I have a question for you guys. Does C code throw? It's not called C++. It's not called C++. I'm C code. I'm on a C. This is purely C. No. So does it throw? So thank you. That was more or less the answer. Let me just hear one more here. Well, it would be if it takes like a function pointer. Sorry? If it takes a function pointer, it throws? Yeah. Like QSOR. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're talking about if I call VSC. I'm, I'm going to get into that, but just going before. Yes, you're right. The answer there was right. Of course, C code cannot throw C++ exceptions, but it might have something similar to an exception that behaves more or less the same. So yes, the C++, the C language has no support for exceptions, unless you're called Microsoft, in which case there are exceptions in C code. And in fact, like you said, thank you for that, crashes are thrown as exceptions. In C code, of course, you cannot catch them. If you're writing C++ code, you might realize that uh, due to a null pointer dereference, you got a stuck and wind, then your code started running again. Right? Now, what you said here was interesting. What happens if I pass, if I call a C function, and I pass it the pointer to a C++ function, that throws an exception. What happens there? Um, usually it will crash. Uh, unless you're also using Linux. Right now, Linux has this thing that even the C library is exception safe. What they're doing is they matched exception throwing with the POSIX asynchronous cancellation of threads. So how this works, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, POSIX asynchronous cancellation. It means that a thread can be canceled by another thread. There are three modes in which the cancellation can happen. Uh, synchronous and the synchronous and two modes of, uh, I think, two modes of synchronous. That is, I can tell, do not do anything. I will check, I will ask pthread, have I been canceled every now and then? And if so, I will do it myself. So hands off, I will figure out. This is one of the synchronous modes. The second synchronous mode is cancellation point. Certain functions when I call in POSIX are allowed to check if the thread has been canceled, and if so, Cancel my thread. The asynchronous one, same thing, but can happen any time. So my code is running, doing whatever it wants, and suddenly it can get cancelled. The way GCC implements this, specifically on Linux, but I think on other platforms as well, is that a cancellation, which needs to run pthread cleanup handlers, it actually goes up as an exception. So you run your destructors. You can even catch it. You shouldn't, but you can catch it. Um, and do something about it. This has been discussed as possible C++ 11 feature. So if standard, exception, standard thread has support for remote cancellation, how does the stack unwind? To be clear, um, the, mode, the default mode, which is call a function, and that function checks the cancellation points, are exactly the same as that function declares as I can throw. So what glibc does is that every function that is not a cancellation point is declared as no throw. So the compiler can generate the right code. But those functions which are will generate in C++ mode the exception safety code and exception handler. If you change your thread into a synchronous cancellation, you probably cannot write exception safe code because anything that you can do in between instructions can throw. It's not for the faint of heart. Yes? Just to see that I understand. So what you are saying is that if a C function is, is calling one of the process functions, which is a cancellation point, then this function will automatically by the compiler be 
mark this that it can throw. So you're just, ask, just repeating for the camera. Uh, you're asking for a little more uh, explanation. So the way it does is that. Let me give you an example of Ken selection point. The POSIX write function, right? So what it does is that that function in specific is declared in the header with nothing beyond it, right? Nothing besides it. That means C++, this function can throw, right? I, can think of, I cannot think of one function right now, but there are certain functions that cannot throw. The, 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 the C library says they are not cancellation points. That means these functions will be marked as no throw. So when, you, when you're writing your C++ code, the compiler will see this function cannot throw. I don't need to create anything specifically for it. But you're calling write here. That means that function could throw. So I will write your exception handler. Right? Especially for running your destructors. Now, if you take one level of indirection, there are functions in the C library that call the cancellation points. Those functions must be declared as throwable as well. So the C library developers need to figure out which functions can call which other functions, and you cannot call another that wasn't supposed to. So I cannot, for whatever reason, my function that was not calling right decide to call right now. I just can't, because it would be able to, it would throw. So like I said, this will require probably a lot of effort on both committees to standardize. The no accept macros, uh, I was just talking about no throw. Uh, we do have three macros here. No throw meaning no accept if it's supported, or if you're a Microsoft Visual Studio, it uses no throw. This is because on the Qt side, we do not use the older no throw in C++ 98 because, like the question asked, it created overhead. So we'd never use that. If in your code you have C++ 98 no throw, you probably do not want to use this macro. And we have the no accept that really means no accept. Um, I don't think we're using it anywhere. And then, of course, there is no accept with expression. Um, the example I'm showing here is q hash of a pair. Uh, q hash of a pair throws if either hashing function of the members of the pair throw. Or, in other words, it is no accept if both are no accept, which is what the expression here, um, this is the wrong function, <laughs> but does the same thing. This is the seeding version, right? So. Our value refs, um, they look deceptively easy. Um, there is a problem I'm going to go into. So more usually, our value refs start using them, add move semantics everywhere. Just a lot of monkey work, a lot of work to do. There are two problems left. Um, I'm going to get into them. One is this one. Um, the non-inline move constructor, right? So when we beginning talked about inline move constructors, those are there in Qt code I showed for QList. If your code is using non-inline move constructors, then I have a problem. Well, of course, you have a problem if you're trying to do non-inline because we would break the requirement we had in Qt. But this guy here cannot be inlined. I can write this inline constructor here. So what I'm trying to do here is provide a move constructor for this class by moving the other with a private implementation. This class here, my private, is not available. I'm just trying to use uh, a smart pointer here. So what I wanted to do is like swap or just move. This does not compile. Does not compile because it tries to instantiate the destructor for this type because of an exception support. So that thing there could throw, even though it's not doing anything. The compiler is required to create, the at least imagine the, the destructor, the exception support. And since this is for declared, it will say, cannot do it. The other question we had on uh, moved objects are, 
what happens to the object after it's been moved. So far, I've been talking to people, the answer has been, it's left in a valid but undefined state. Sure, previous slide. Um, I think the fix for this case is you provide the destructor that you, it's out of line. The, you're, saying, you're suggesting that the solution is to provide a destructor that is out of line. This is just a shortened example. We've tried with destructors, it doesn't work. The problem is that in the unwind sequence, so the compiler needs to th think of it as at any point that it could throw. Right, and I've tried to put no accepts everywhere. It still, still does not solve the problem. It might need to destroy what it has already initialized. Right? So what happens is that this guy has got initialized. So what happens if it throws after that? It needs to de-initialize this guy. It's not my class. It's my class private that needs a destructor and it's not visible at this point in time. I don't know if this was intended in the standard or if it's just GCC being wrong, but right now we cannot use it. So yes? If you, if you make the QShare data pointer move construct and no except, it's still uh, Yes, if I make the QShare data pointer move constructor no except, it still does this have the same problem. It sounds like a bug. I haven't been able to prove it yet. I haven't found the specific se sections of the standard that would support this. So just moving on. Um, sure, I can leave my object in an undefined state. Most cases is that after it, this undefined state must at least be uh, destructible because that variable is going to go out of scope and it must be moved on t uh, where I can move something into it, again, to make it a, a known state. But what else? At uh, this point, I think that the answer is we're figuring out, everybody together. I don't think you can do anything else. No, I thought you could yeah, reuse it. I think you reinitialize it. Yeah, well, you, you could potentially move, move, move into it, but you really shouldn't use it at that point until you do. Yeah, so basically, repeating for the camera, the discussion is what can you do? Probably the only thing move, on, move into. The, the, standard only, like, the standard requires that if you move into a, or if you use that type in a container, that when you move from it, any operation that can be used on that type by that container or that algorithm or whatever um, be valid. Like, that's basically every operation that's required by the standard has to be um, available and work. Uh, uh, we need to talk a little so more. Instance, swap. You'd have to be able to swap that with another container. Sure. If, if you're saying that there are certain operations like, like swapping that should be possible. Right. Um, uh, we need to talk a little more, discuss which operations these are. Right. So because I, I need to understand, we're, we're doing this. I need to understand, besides being destructible, what else can I do? So summarizing move semantics, we would like to support everywhere. There's a lot of work and we need to be careful about behavior compatibility. Because some of the classes that we want to support move into uh, did not like having D pointers be null at the end. The destructor would crash if that was the case. All right, binary compatibility, my session of yesterday. Uh, can you change an inline function? Yes provided that the old inline function, if called, still works. So if I change my member to say it's valid now to be a null, we need to be careful about that. Um, I'm still in the letter R and have a half an hour left. Um, ref qualifiers, this is one of the newest things. That's the last feature that GCC implemented in 481. I started playing with it and found a bug. <laughs> And so it's fixed in 4H2. My question here for the people in the back is, I create a temporary Q string. This is formatting. Uh, and I call arg and arg. Um, right now, what these do is that each call creates a new, new temporary and returns it. 
So by the end of that uh, line, I created three temporaries. One of them is the return value. So hopefully return value optimization kicked in, and I only have two temporaries plus the return value. Can I improve this? Right. So uh, this is research I'm doing right now. Can I make this function here, because it knows it's a temporary, return itself or move semantics? Right. So I don't create more. I, I, I still have a temporary, but I do not allocate extra memory. I do not keep extra memory allocated because I'm doing this. So that's the question. Can we avoid the temporaries? My problem is the standard says that if you declare any overload with um, the R value or L value cement with the ref qualifiers, all of them have to be declared with ref qualifiers. And the, GC, the, the ABI changed. So I need to provide with and without qualifiers, I need to provide three overloads for each arg function. So let's take this example here. There's one arg that's taking an int, right? Taking an int. Right now there's one overload for it. It's just one. I need to provide now one without ref qualifiers for compatibility with old code. I need to provide one for R value and one for L value. So I need to duplicate each. I need to, each function <coughs> needs to exist in three times. And I cannot have the same header for both of them because I cannot, uh, the compiler cannot see all three. So I'm re researching that. Static assertions, really, really useful. By all means, start using it. And we provide a fallback to C++ 98. Um, it's, uh, you probably have done this in the past. Mm. If you haven't, it's very simple. You just declare an array with minus one in size, the compiler will complain. Or some other things like using a type that is for declared or whatever, size of an unfor declared type, anything that would cause the compiler to error out if the um, condition is false. Unfortunately, <coughs> as a fallback, we don't have the error message. Thread local, uh, again, it's something that's been supported as extensions for a long time in some uh, OSs. We do have a fallback as a full class in Qt because pthread also provides it. I need to investigate if I can make something nicer. Um, I don't have a macro for this one, uh, global statics. Finally, C++11, because it understands threads, it knows what a thread is, it defined that a local scope static. So I declare a static in my class, my, my function, not in my class, not as a full thing, a global variable. It's inside my function. It says that it's initialized when first used, right? C++ 98 says that if I re-enter it, it's undefined behavior. Usually we'll let deadlock or whatever. But it did not say anything about two threads trying to initialize at the same time. The compilers subscribing to the C++ ABI have sol solved this for some time. They do, uh, there's a mutex around each variable, each, each static. C++ 11 says, yes, it's thread safe, and moreover, it cannot deadlock. <laughs> so what we do is that if it, you're, you were running on a compiler that supports the feature or uh, that we know to support the feature, we use it. <coughs> Otherwise, we implement our own mutex with a guard variable. The nicer thing is that I have a couple extra features on top. <coughs> so a global static that I created here, I can verify whether it has been initialized. If an initialization is, is expensive, I can check if it's been initialized before and not do anything. And at the end of the execution, I can also verify whether it has already been destroyed. Because I cannot verify in which order things will happen. So if my code depends on this, I can at the end of the execution verify whether my static has been destroyed and probably do nothing or return a default value or something. 
Unicode strings, very useful and very welcome. Thank you for having that. Unfortunately, we never use it directly. Uh, if you want to use it, great. Uh, we have support for it in the library. But we cannot use it directly because that would be those cases of if defs for uglier code. So what we have is that we have a macro that hides it. The qString literal macro is one of those. So answering the question from the beginning, can you show me an example of where things can become faster? This is one. If your compiler supports lambdas and UTF-16 string literals, uh, it will create the, the string on a read-only memory of the set, the, your binary with no runtime overhead. If you're compiling with, without those, you need to call a function to interpret from UTF-8. And that enforces that all source code must be UTF-8. So how did we do this? The goal was qString literal must return a qString and not allocate any memory. Um, I'm not going to re read this for you, but basically it's what we needed is we need a static in order to be in uh, read-only memory. I cannot add a static here. So the only thing I could do is like, create a lambda so I can put the static inside the lambda and return that static. Um, this presentation will be available to you so you can look at the code and I can also point out qString.h, you're going to see this code there. It's slightly more complicated, but what it's doing is that it creates the, the D pointer of qString in static memory and returns it. With an evil const cast, uh, but it works. Now, my problem is that the standard, st the standard committee stopped short of full support. So take, for example, this example here, U16 string with a Unicode string written resume. Um, for the people in the back, the second character is an E with a cute symbol, with a cute sign. I wrote this on my machine. This is my machine here, it's running Linux, and I compiled it and I printed the value of the first character. So the first car 16, sorry, the second car 16. It printed E9. Can I ask you to remember E9 for me? Sure. For one slide. If I copy the file to Windows and compile with Visual Studio, once it supports Unicode strings, what will it print? So the question is exactly that. Does Visual Studio support Unicode literals? It doesn't. So once it does support, what will it print? By the way, um, how do I print the string? Not one character at a time. What do, how do I print the string? Isn't there an overload of C out that the, the question is, is there an overload? The answer is no. At least there wasn't a compiling with uh, GCC yesterday. It might be missing, like I said, library training behind. So let's try it on Windows. Of course, this Visual Studio, it does not understand uh, the new Unicode literals. So what I did is that I changed it to wide character. And I know that on Windows, wide uh, WHRT is UTF-16. It's actually 30, uh, 16 bits in width. That compiles. What was the number I asked to remember? E9. E9. Let's see what it prints. Close enough. Hmm? <laughs> Close enough? It's just wrong. So my problem is, I wrote my source code, and I want to give it to somebody else, and I want you to have the same strings. Committee stopped short of defining how does the compiler interpret this array of bytes that is my file that, so that we have the same source code? Can, you go back to the first slide? Can I go back to the other slide? Yes. So it printed E9. I'll tell you why. E9, because this was interpreted, I wrote this as UTF-8. This here is two bytes, right? C3, what's the second byte? A9, C3, A9, right? As interpreted as C3 uh, UTF-8, these two bytes are the, C, the Unicode uh, 00E9 
uh, Latin small e with acute. That's why you got e9 here, right? And sorry. I did not understand you. Canonicity issue, they use the, the ones using the canonical form and ones using the other one? It's not a canonicity issue. Um, now, when I moved this to uh, Windows, what happens is that the same file, and this is UTF-8. Visual Studio opened it and understood this is UTF-8, right, because it showed the right character. But when it compiled, it interpreted this as Latin 1. So the two bytes that make uh, the letter E, it actually interpreted as two bytes and got me C3. I hope that by the time they get Unicode support, this is fixed, but I'm not holding my hopes up. There are several reasons why we can discuss later. Is there a standard local? Is there a standard locale? No, there isn't. The standard defines that your source code does not even have to be ASCII. Nobody does anything but ASCII these days, but standard still supports those. I need to move on. We're running slightly out of time. Uh, User-defined literals. Um, neat, but we haven't used them yet. Um, I'm really hoping that this paper comes into C++14. And let me just read the quote from the paper. Indeed, this form of literal operator has been requested more frequently than any of the forms in which C++11 permits. What, am I, what do I want? It's something that was removed from the standard before standardization. I want to get the characters of the string. So I want string with underscore Q, for example. And I don't want to be given um, uh, a car pointer. I want each and every uh, car 16. So I can put this on read-only memory. So the question is, why can we do digits but not characters? The both were supported in one earlier versions of the paper supporting this. They were removed. I'm not sure exactly why. I think it was determined that this would be too complex to implement in the compilers, uh, or they weren't, had not many uses. Turns out that this is actually very wanted, so they're changing their minds. So you're saying that if you could inspect the character literal at compile time, you could provide a type safe printf. Yes, type you probably would. Not just type safe, but compile yes. time. Compile time, yes, they probably could do that, something like that. Now, I'm done with the features themselves. Just one more note. Um, we find latent bugs everywhere for two reasons. Because the compiler is implementing them, and we run into bugs. Or because it's code that has never been compiled as C++11 and suddenly gets it. Uh, on Linux and on Mac, we get newer versions of the compilers all the time. On Windows, for two reasons, we have older compilers. Uh, MinGW has been stuck in the past for a while, and Visual Studio updates slowly. So every now and then, when we do get an upgrade, we run into code, Windows-specific, that had never been compiled to C++11. So you need to keep an eye out for bug reports. Now I'll talk about C++11. So just a few thoughts on the future. C++ 1Y. There's a new feature being proposed. I already added uh, the define to Qt, but I cannot detect it at compile time because GCC forgot to tell me that the flag was passed. Um, but those, this is one of the examples of language features that would require an ifdef to be nice, and um, we're probably not going to use it for some time. So what do we need to do? We need to finish what we started. We need to do the move semantics, like I said. There's a lot of work to do it carefully. We uh, need to be careful about template bloat. Uh, I would like to detect the standard library features um, as they come, so I can start using them. Right now, I don't have a good way to do that. And as the compiler features come in, uh, play with them. What would I like to see in the language, or what we would like to see in the language? So I have a couple of complaints from previous slides. In terms of the language, not very much. C++11 was, was really good, for, solved most of the, some of the issues that we had. 
But I guess that it's going to be things that we didn't know we need. Like C++11, many of the things that came are like, oh, cool, I can do that now. But I had never missed it. So it's solutions for problems I didn't know I had. I'm glad, I'll be gladly and hope, uh, pleasantly surprised for new things that come and solve problems I didn't know I had. What I'm keeping an, out, an eye out for, um, concepts um, and metaprogramming. We have in Qt the meta object and meta type support. They could use a little more help by metaprogramming and with concepts. So I'm keeping an eye out to see how these things go. I'm keeping an eye out for modules to see um, where this is going, how it's going to be implemented, how we could use it. And something that has been in discussion for years and um, not holding my hopes up, reflection. So people ask, can you get rid of mock, uh, the meta object compiler we're using Qt? For signals and slot connections, I gave you an answer, some people an answer, why not? And the main reason why we're never going to get rid of it for now is it allows us to connect C++ to other languages. So we do integrate easily C++ with JavaScript and IPC mechanisms because we can get that runtime information about what the object looks like. If we get a reflection support in um, C++, we might be able to get rid of mock. So you're asking, what would I like to see so that we avoid bloating uh, the library, binary, whatever, because it has to keep all the information for every single thing it used? Right now with mock, in order to trigger it, there's a macro inside the class. C++11 allows us to use attributes. So I would expect that if I put a certain attribute in a class or in a function or whatever, that gets uh, the reflection support turned on. So it's an opt-in feature. And then at runtime, it can ask for it, probably with a type ID, and ask the um, standard type info class, did this get reflection? Right? And if so, can I get the information? Which, mod which functions do you have? Uh, how can they be called? And I have to go a little further than just reflection. I need to be able to call at runtime, a function that I found via reflection. I think you all are running the same issue as we had with explicit template instantiation. Because what happens to types in, that are used in the class that you mark, marked for reflection? So you're saying that this will probably have some uh, work with, expli with templates, explicit templates. It's not a problem that I have right now because mock does not work on template classes. Exactly for that reason, because I do not know no, no, what gets... I'm saying that you will have the same problem. The issue is basically, when, when you add an, an attribute that says that this class needs to support reflection, do you also automatically mark all the types that it uses, like base types and member types? Oh, I see. I see what you mean. So you're saying if I mark a specific class as requiring reflection support, what does it imply for... Uh, base types and uh, types used in its construction, as well as returns and parameters of functions that it has. Um, good question. Uh, the way that mock works today is that some types are, uh, of course, in all the base types are known, so it needs to go all the way back to the base type. It probably would mean you can only use this attribute if you're deriving from a class that also uses this attribute. And uh, primitives, uh, all, the temp all the types, for example, they're just known by their names. I get into trouble when I try to call that function, though. Probably something to discuss for a couple of years before it becomes standard. How about the standard library? We don't use much of it. Uh, we are going to continue not using much of it, but we will keep an eye out and contribute experience. For example, um, standard URI. Um, networking URI, there are four papers already. If you look at the progression of those papers, you see that uh, they're coming close to QURL, which I wrote, uh, which means that uh, 
implementations converging, it means our, our features would, will be supported, um, and it also validates my design. So that's good to know. <coughs> Event loop, we're going to keep an eye out. To be honest, I'm a little scared about Boost ASIO coming into the standard. Uh, we have so many requirements of event loops. We need integration with existing event loops. We do not need one more. Uh, so if the standard manages to have something that we can use as syntactic sugar for existing event loops, that would be great. You mean native event loops? Native event loops like glib. Or think about it. Will the new C++ standard event loop, if when that comes, support the Qt event loop? I, I, sorry, I think in the HU you don't necessarily need to use the event loop, right? You can just do like check even, and then you can just call there. Uh, so you're saying that the SIU you could just uh, check for exi existing events without running an event loop? Exactly. Yeah, that, that's probably fine. I would not have a problem with that. And this is really about event loops. If there is an event loop, um, what would it mean? So I'm keeping an eye out. And like I said just before the session started, I would like to see simplification of common use cases rather than uh, adding functionality, complex functionality, as feature complete as it might be, um, to uh, the, the standard. Just to give you two examples, how do I convert an int to standard U16 string? And um, dealing with the local codec. I looked at the standard yesterday. I did not find anything on code CVT that works with the local codec. It has UTF-8, UTF-16, UTF-32. I'm missing the local. I need to communicate with the outside world. So into string, it's already got that, right? Isn't there like a two string in the... Yeah, there is a two string. There's a two string that'll convert to an STD uh, string or, or wide string. Yes. Sorry, what does have that? C++ standard now. No. What class? It's, 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 it's a string, string header. header. I think it's a string, string header. Like uh, GCC, I don't think, implements it. Uh, that might be because... Microsoft okay, does. okay, okay. okay. It's so, a free function. It's a free function. Okay, so that might be the case because I looked at it and I couldn't find it in my implementation yeah. of GCC. It might have been in the standard. It's, but It's a free function and it's in GCC at least in 4.7. Okay, so standard two string of an int creates a standard string. That is exactly what I, I'm asking for. Simplify common use cases. Let's work on making uh, common use cases shorter and simpler. What we really, really need is not from the standard. We need to work with the compilers. So our problem is really compilers and operating systems. Um, one thing that actually came out of um, uh, a paper is realloc in place. Real extend or shrink if you can, but do not move data. Do not return me a different pointer. Why? Imagine that my objects need to be nude. Right? So if, I, if you give me more room, I'll add stuff. But if you, need, if, if you move, I need to new again. That doesn't help me. Right? So right now, I cannot use realloc if I have uh, C++ objects that cannot be mem copied. I'm not going to read the rest. Basically, it's a lot of things that we would like to see tooling, um, or support that uh, completely outside the standard. Uh, conclusion, I'm just going to repeat a few things as we are out of time. Um, if you're trying to do what we did, which is support C++11, if you can, require C++11 for new versions. Tell your customers we're going to use C++11. Uh, if you want C++98, uh, cost more. If you cannot avoid that, then target both simultaneously. And uh, we, I've given you some of the hints of how we did it. In any case, even if you cannot use C++11 now, um, familiarize with the memory model. When doing both at the same time, determine which compilers are the minimum that you require. Focus on the features that the, your user will not require changing on. And resist re-implementing all of the flags and defines that I've given you. Um, use the ones from Boost or Qt themselves. That was it. Do we, I have still five minutes left. Are there more questions? So I guess 
this just probably every mark. You mentioned that you build uh, QT with C++ 9 TA, right? Either a shared object or a static object. Right? And then you build your library with C++ 11 and 18. Imagine the same function uh, appears in both variables as a symbol. Right? So it, it will have the same symbol. But in the body, they use different things. One use you know, constructors, the other just code. Okay. So what you're saying is, imagine a certain function when compiled uh, into two different libraries, two different modules, um, the same function. One was compiled C++ 98, one C++ 11, and for, because they were different, they have a different code. Now, C++, the, the language requires a one definition rule, one, only one of them should exist. Well, we violate ODR all of the time because probably if you have this one function that exists in two libraries, it's an inline function. And if it's an inline function uh, via export control on the libraries, that function will not be merged at runtime. Well, so the code that compiled it as C++11, the rest of the code around it is also C++11 and will not call the other one. Well, I, I, I have to disagree here. Um, I think what Okay. Yeah. Right. Select, right. So you, if you're, you're saying that um, if this thing is either at a static link time, right. in that case, yes. In the case of the static link time, you would have a problem because the same symbol would appear twice and the implementations are wrong. I had the same problem unrelated to C++ 98 or 11. I had um, code compiled with AVX support for my machine. <coughs> uh, the same function, it was an inline function, uh, compiling Qt, and at link time the compiler chose one, it made the wrong choice, chose the one that was AVX supported, and of course that crashed on older machines. Um, my answer to that would be, um, if you're doing static compilation, uh, you probably should just choose one and not uh, mix and match. Right. On a shared library, this problem should not happen. Uh, you think it, it doesn't? I think it doesn't because all of the inline and all V functions in this case, they are hidden and they would not be subject to uh, runtime merging. I can show you the details later. Okay. Other questions, one more? I guess that you guys are hungry. It's lunchtime. So thank you very much, very much for everybody for coming. I'm still around if you want to ask me questions. I'm still around until tomorrow midday. Thank you. So